Hi, Rachel here with the Charlotte Mason Plenary. We're so glad you found the audiobook of Volume 6, Charlotte's Last Volume, A Philosophy of Education. It is by far, in my opinion, the best and most transformative volume, so you're definitely in the right place. Now, we at a Charlotte Mason Plenary are offering this audio to you perfectly free because we think everybody should be reading Charlotte's words. However, we do offer an annotated edition in both print and in the audiobook version. So, the best of both worlds, in my opinion, is the audiobook, whether it has annotations or not, and the annotated editions. Because in the annotated editions, you get all of these wonderful side notes in the margins that explain what Charlotte's talking about, as well as give you definitions and stuff to all that uh, Victorian English. So, best of both worlds, audiobook and annotated edition. Please visit us over at a Charlotte Mason Plenary at cmplenary.com, and I hope you enjoy the audiobook. Chapter 7 How We Make Use of Mind we hold that the child's mind is no mere sack to hold ideas, but is rather, if the figure may be allowed, a spiritual organism with an appetite for all knowledge. This is its proper diet with which it is prepared to deal, and what it is able to digest and assimilate as the body does foodstuffs. Such a doctrine as the Herbartian, that the mind is a receptacle, lays the stress of education, the preparation of food and enticing morsels duly ordered upon the teacher. Children taught on this principle are in danger of receiving much teaching but little knowledge, the teacher's axiom being what a child learns matters less than how he learns it. I cannot resist presenting the Herbartian psychology in the dry light of Scottish humor. We have failed to explain ideas by the mind. How about explaining the mind by ideas? You are not to suppose that this is exactly how Herbart puts it. Herbart is a philosopher, a German philosopher. It is true that he starts with the mind, or, as he prefers to call it, a soul. But do not fear that the sport of the hunt is to be spoiled for that. The given soul is no more a real soul than it is a real crater of a volcano. It has absolutely no content. It is not even an idea trap. Ideas can slip in and out of it as they please, or rather, as other ideas please, but the soul has no power either to call, make, keep, or recall an idea. The ideas arrange all these matters among themselves. The mind can make no objection. The soul has no capacity nor faculty whatever either to receive or produce anything. It is therefore no tabula rasa in the sense that impressions foreign to its nature may be made on it. Also, it is no substance in Leibniz's sense, which includes original self-activity. It has originally neither ideas nor feelings nor desires. Further, within it lie no forms of intuition and thought, no laws of willing or acting nor any sort of predisposition, however remote, towards these. The simple nature of the soul is totally unknown and forever remains so. It is as little a subject for speculative as for empirical psychology. Lehrbuch zur Psychologie by Herbart, Part 3, pages 152-153. Thus, a vigorous vis inertia is the only power of the mind. Still, it is subject to the action of certain forces. Nothing but ideas, Wurstelung, can attack the soul so that the ideas really make up the mind. We are familiar with the struggle of ideas on the threshold, with the good luck of those that get in, and especially of those that get in first and mount to high places. With the behavior of ideas very much like that of persons who fall into groups in an anarchical state. This behavior is described as the formation of apperception masses, and the mass that is sufficiently strong has it all its own way and dominates the mind. Our business is not to examine the psychology of Herbart, a very serious and suggestive contribution to our knowledge of educational principles, but rather to consider how it works out practically in education. But before we examine how Herbartian psychology bears this test of experiment, let us consider what Professor William James has to say of psychology in general. When we talk of psychology as a natural science, he tells us, we must not assume that that means a sort of psychology that stands at last on solid ground. 
It means just the reverse. It means a psychology particularly fragile and into which the waters of metaphysical criticism leak at every point, a psychology all of whose elementary assumptions and data must be reconsidered in wider connections and translated into other terms. It is, in short, a phrase of diffidence and not of arrogance, and it is indeed strange to hear people talk triumphantly of the new psychology and write histories of psychology when into the real elements and forces which the word covers not the first glimpse of clear insight exists. A string of raw facts, a little gossip and wrangle about opinions, a little classification and generalization on the mere descriptive level, but not a single law, not a single proposition from which any consequence can casually be deduced. But Professor James went on and wrote his extraordinarily interesting book on psychology, and we must do the same, though our basis is no more than the common experience of mankind, so far as one mind can express the experience common to us all. Herbartian psychology is extraordinarily gratifying and attractive to teachers who are, like other people, eager to magnify their office. And here is a scheme which shows how every child is a new creation as he comes forth from the hands of his teacher. The teacher learns how to do it. He has but to draw together a mass of those ideas which themselves will combine in the mind into which they effect an entrance, and behold, the thing is done. The teacher has done it. He has selected the ideas, shown the correlation of each with the other, and the work is complete. The ideas establish themselves, the most potent rule and gather force, and if these be good, the man is made. Here, for example, is a single week's correlation of subjects worked out by a highly qualified teacher. Arithmetic, decimal fractions, mathematics, simple equations, parallelograms, science, latent heat, housecraft, nerves, thought, habits, geography, Scotland, general industries, or again for another week under the same headings, metric problems, symbols, four rules, triangles, some angles, machinery, circulation, sculpture of the British Isles. The ideas no doubt have an agility and ability which we do not possess and know how to jump at each other and form the desired apperception masses. A successful and able modern educationalist gives us a valuable introduction to Herbartian principles and, by way of example, a Robinson Crusoe concentration scheme, a series of lessons given to children in Standard 1 in an elementary school. First, we have nine lessons in literature and language, the subjects being such as Robinson climbs a hill and finds he is on an island. Then, ten object lessons, of which the first is the sea. The second, a ship from foreign parts. The sixth, a lifeboat. The seventh, shellfish. The tenth, a cave. How these objects are to be produced, one does not see. The third series are drawing lessons, probably as many, a boat, a ship, an oar, an anchor, and so on. Then follows a series on manual training, still built upon Robinson. The first, a model of the seashore, then models of Robinson's island, of Robinson's house, and Robinson's pottery. The next course consists of reading an indefinite number of lessons, passages from the child's Robinson Crusoe, and from a general reader on the matters discussed in object lessons. Then follows a series of writing lessons, simple compositions on the subject of the lessons. The children frame the sentences which the teacher wrote on the blackboard and the class copied afterwards. Here is one composition. Robinson spent his first night in a tree. In the morning he was hungry, but he saw nothing round him but grass and trees without fruit. On the seashore he found some shellfish which he ate. Compare this with the voluminous output of children of six or seven working on the PUS scheme upon any subject that they know, with, indeed, the pages they will dictate after a single reading of a chapter of Robinson Crusoe, not a child's edition. Arithmetic follows, no doubt, as many lessons, many mental examples and simple problems dealt with Robinson. The eighth and last course was in singing and recitation, I am monarch of all I survey, etc., the lessons lasted about 45 minutes each. Under ordinary conditions, the story of Robinson Crusoe would be the leading feature in the work of a whole year. In comparing the English classes with the German classes I have seen studying Robinson Crusoe, I was convinced that the eagerness and interest was as keen among the children here as in the German schools. 
one easily sees what a wealth of material there is in the further development of the story. One does indeed. The whole thing must be highly amusing to the teacher, as ingenious amplifications self-produced always are. That the children, too, were entertained one does not doubt. The teacher was probably at her best in getting by sheer force much out of little. She was, in fact, acting a part, and the children were entertained as at a show, cinema, or other. But of one thing we may be sure, an utter distaste, a loathing on the part of the children ever after, not only for Robinson Crusoe, but for every one of the subjects lugged in to illustrate his adventures. We read elsewhere of an apple affording a text for a hundred lessons, including the making of a ladder in paper to gather the apples. But, alas, the eating of the worn-out apple is not suggested. The author whom we quote for Robinson Crusoe, and whom we refrain from naming, because, as a Greek chorus might say, we cannot praise, follows the Robinson series with another interminable series on the Armada. The conscientious, ingenious, and laborious teachers who produce these concentration series are little aware that each such lesson is an act of la majesty. The children who are capable of and eager for a wide range of knowledge and literary expression are reduced to inanities. A lifelong ennui is set up. Every approach to knowledge suggests avenues for boredom, and the children's minds sicken and perish long before their school days come to an end. I have pursued this subject at some length because we too believe in ideas as the proper and only diet upon which children's minds grow. We are more in the dark about mind than about Mars. We can but judge by effects, and these appear to point to the conclusion that mind is a spiritual organism. I need not apologize for speaking of that which has no substance as an organism. No greater a contradiction in terms than Herbart's apperception masses. By an analogy with body, we conclude that mind requires regular and sufficient sustenance, and that this sustenance is afforded by ideas we may gather from the insatiable eagerness with which these are appropriated, and the evident growth and development manifested under such pabulum, that children like feeble and tedious oral lessons, feeble and tedious story books, does not at all prove that these are wholesome food. They like lollipops but cannot live upon them, yet there is a serious attempt in certain schools to supply the intellectual, moral, and religious needs of children by appropriate sweet meats. As I have said elsewhere, the ideas required for the sustenance of children are to be found mainly in books of literary quality. Given these, the mind does for itself the sorting, arranging, selecting, rejecting, classifying which Herbart leaves to the struggle of the promiscuous ideas which manage to cross the threshold. Nor is this merely a nominal distinction. Herbart was a philosopher, and therefore his thought embraced the universal. Probably few schools of the day are consciously following the theories of this philosopher, but in most schools in England and elsewhere, so far as any intelligent rationale is followed, it is that of Herbart. There are many reasons for this fact. A scheme which throws the whole burden of education on the teacher, which exalts the personality of the teacher as the chief agent in education, which affords ingenious, interesting, and more or less creative work to a vast number of highly intelligent and devoted persons whose passionate hope is to leave the world a little better than they found it by means of those children whom they have raised to a higher level, must needs make a wide and successful appeal. It appeals equally to education committees and school managers. Consider the saving involved in the notion that teachers are compendiums of all knowledge, that they have but, as it were, to turn on the tap and the necessary knowledge flows forth. All responsibility is shifted, and the relief is very great. Not only so, but lessons are delightful to watch and to hear. The success of jigsaw puzzles illustrates a tendency in human nature to delight in the ingenious putting together of unlikely things, as, for example, a life buoy and Robinson Crusoe. There is a series of small triumphs to be observed any day of the week, and these same triumphs are brought about by dramatic display. So ingenious, pleasing, fascinating are the ways in which the teacher chooses to arrive at her point. I say her point because women excel in this kind of teaching, but men do not come far short. What of the children themselves? 
They, too, are amused and entertained. They enjoy the puzzle element and greatly enjoy the teacher who lays herself out to attract them. There is no flaw in the practical working of the method while it is being carried out. Later, it gives rise to dismay and anxiety among thoughtful people. Much water has run under the bridge since several years ago Mr. A. Patterson startled us out of self-complacency with his Across the Bridges. We as a nation were well pleased at the time with the result of our efforts. Nothing could be more intelligent, alert, brighter than the seventh standard boy about to leave school and take up his life work. Conditions were unpropitious. We know the old story of inviting blind alleys, present success, and then unemployment with resulting depreciation in character. What is to be done? The question of after conditions is now being taken up seriously. We have continuation classes, which even if a boy be out of work will help him to the Chinese art of saving his face. But Mr. Patterson condemns the schools for the rapidity with which their best boys run to seed. He does not quote the case of the boy who gets work, earns fair wages, conducts himself respectfully, goes to a polytechnic, the sort of boy with whom Mr. Pet Ridge makes us familiar, who is so much less than he might be, so crude in his notions, so unmoral in his principles, so poor in his interests, so meager if not coarse in his choice of pleasures, and after all such a good fellow at bottom." He might have been taught in school to utilize his powers, to come into the enjoyment of the fine mind that is in him. But in schools, there is too much learning and too little work. The teacher ready to use the powers of his training and experience have given him works too hard, while the boy's share in the struggle is too light. It is possible to make education too easy for children and to rob learning of the mental discipline which often wearies, but in the end produces concentration and the capacity to work alone. He is rarely left to himself with the book in his hands, forced to concentrate all his mind on the dull words before him, with no one at hand to explain or make the memory work easier by little tricks of repetition and association. The boy who reaches the seventh standard with every promise and enters the service of a railway company is first required to sit down by himself and master the symbols of the telegraphic code. This he finds extremely irksome, for the only work he has ever done alone before is the learning of racy poetry, which is the very mildest form of mental discipline. Silent reading is occasionally allowed in odd half-hours. It might well be a regular subject, for reading aloud is but a poor gift compared with the practice of reading in private. What does his curriculum do for the boy? Let us again hear Mr. Patterson. What is the educational idea set before the average boy whose school days are to end at 14? What type is it that the authorities seek to produce? A glance at the syllabus will reassure the ordinary cynic who still labors under the quaint delusion that French and algebra and violin playing are taught in every London elementary school at the expense of the ratepayer. The syllabus was designed to leave a boy at 14 with a thoroughly sound and practical knowledge of reading, writing, and arithmetic, and with such grounding in English, geography, and history as may enable him to read a newspaper or to give a vote with some idea of what he is doing. But these are all subsidiary to teaching the three R's, which between them occupy more than half the 24 hours of teaching in the week. It is certain that the present object in view is dispiriting to master and boy alike, for a knowledge of reading, writing, and arithmetic is no education and no training, but merely the elementary condition of further knowledge. In many schools, the boy is laboring on with these mere rudiments for two or more years after all reasonable requirements have been satisfied. The intelligent visitor looking at the notebooks of an average class will be amazed at the high standard of the neatness and accuracy, but he will find the excellence of a very visible order. The handwriting is admirable. Sixteen boys out of thirty can write compositions without a flaw in grammar or spelling. Yet it will occur to him that the powers of voluntary thought and reason, of spontaneous inquiry and imagination, have not been stirred. This very perfection of form makes him suspicious as to the fundamental principles of our state curriculum. In public schools, boys are not trained to be lawyers or parsons or doctors, but to be men. If they have learned to work systematically and think independently, 
they are then fit to be trained for such life and profession as taste or necessity may dictate. But at our elementary schools we seem to aim at producing a nation of clerks, for it is only to a clerk that this perfection of writing and spelling is a necessary training. The very faults of his qualities nullify the work of the teacher. His failing is that he does too much. Once more we quote our authority. With the average boy there is a marked waste of mental capital between the ages of 10 and 13, and the aggregate of this loss to the country is heavy indeed. Ten years at school conquer many of the drawbacks of home and discover a quick, receptive mind in the normal child. Many opportunities have been lost in these years of school, but after 14 there is a more disastrous relapse. The brain is not taxed again and shrivels into a mere center of limited formulae acting automatically in response to appetite or sensation. The boy's general education fails utterly. Asia is but a name that is difficult to spell, though at school he spoke of its rivers and ports. It is probable that the vocabulary of a working man at forty is actually smaller than it was at fourteen. So shrunk is the power of the mind to feed upon the growing experience of life. Of the majority of boys it is true to say that only half their ability is ever used in the work they find to do on leaving school. The other half curls up and sleeps forever. Here we have a depressing prospect of grievous waste in the future. We all applaud the Education Act of 1918, are convinced that every boy and girl will receive education until the end of his 16th, possibly 18th year. A wave of generous feeling passed over the nation and employers were willing to support the law. And if the eight hours conceded be spent in making the young people more reliable, intelligent, and responsible persons, no doubt the employers will be rewarded for their generosity. But there are rocks ahead. The only way to take advantage of this provision is to make this an eight hours university course. Now, as Mr. Patterson happily remarks, the universities do not undertake to prepare barristers, parsons, stockbrokers, bankers, or even soldiers and sailors, with a specialized knowledge proper for each profession. Their implicit contention is, given a well-educated man with cultivated imagination, trained judgment, wide interests, and he is prepared to master the intricacies of any profession while he knows at the same time how to make use of himself, of the powers with which nature and education have endowed him for his own happiness, the delightful employment of his leisure, for the increased happiness of his neighbors and the well-being of the community, that is, such a man is able not only to earn his living, but to live. The universities fulfill this claim. The various professions abound with men who, in newspaper phrase, are ornaments to their professions, and who gave up leisure and means to serve their fellow citizens as magistrates, church wardens, members of committees, special constables when needed, until lately members of parliament holding service as an honor and as proud as was Godfrey Bertram, that unhappy laird in Guy Mannering, to write J.P. after their names. The enormous amount of voluntary service rendered in such ways throughout the empire, as well as that of insufficiently or duly paid service, justifies the universities in their reading of their peculiar function. But not only so, generous, disinterested work can never be paid for, and our great statesmen, churchmen, soldiers, and civil servants, as well as the members of county, municipal, and urban district councils, have done their devoir over and above the bond. To secure this same splendidly devoted voluntary service from all classes is the task set before us as a nation, a task the more easy because we have all seen it fulfilled in the war when every man was a potential hero. Now, it is not the fact that the army proved itself an unequaled university of our men, offering them increased knowledge, broad views, lofty aims, duty and discipline, along with the finest physical culture. So much so that instead of going on from where the war left off, we have to be on the watch against retrograde movements, physical, moral, and intellectual. The downward grade is always at hand, and we know how easy it is. We cannot afford another great war for the education of our people, but we must in some way supply the university element, and Mr. Fisher's great act points out such a way.
The young people are, for four years, a proper academic period, to be under influences that make for sweetness and light. But we must keep to the academic ideal. All preparation for specialized industries should be taboo. Special teaching towards engineering, cotton spinning, and the rest is quite unnecessary, for every manufacturer knows that, given a likely lad, he will soon be turned into a good workman in the works themselves. The splendid record of women workers in the war supports our contention. The efforts of technical schools and the like are not greatly prized by the heads of firms so far as the technical knowledge they afford goes. Boys from them are employed rather on the off chance that they may turn out intelligent and apt than for what they know beforehand of the business. Here is one more reason for treating the continuation school as the people's university and absolutely eschewing all money-making arts and crafts. Denmark and Scandinavia have tried this general policy of educating young people, not according to the requirements of their trade, but according to their natural capacity to know and their natural desire for knowledge. That desire to know history, poetry, science, art, which is natural to every man. And the success of the experiment, now a century old, is an object lesson for the rest of the world. Germany has pursued a different ideal. Her efforts, too, have been great, unified by the idea of utility. And if we will only remember the lesson, the war has shown us how futile is an education which affords no moral or intellectual uplift, no motive higher than the learner's peculiar advantage and that of the state. Germany became morally bankrupt for a season only, let us hope, not solely because of the war, but as the result of an education which ignored the things of the spirit or gave these a nominal place and a poor rendering in the utilitarian syllabus. We are encouraged to face the fact boldly that it is a people's university we should aim at, a university with its thousands of colleges up and down the land, each of them the continuation school, the name is not inviting, for some one neighborhood. But, it will be argued, the subject matter of a university education is conveyed for the most part through the channel of dead languages, Latin and Greek. Our contention is that however ennobling the literature in these tongues, we cannot honestly allow our English literature to take a second place to any other, and that, therefore, whatever Sophocles, Thucydides, Virgil have it in them to do towards a higher education may be affected more readily by Milton, Gibbon, Shakespeare, Bacon, and a multitude of great thinkers who are therefore great writers. Learning conveyed in our common speech is easier come by than that secreted in a dead language, and this fact will help us to deal with the inadequacy of the period allowed. Given absolute attention, and we can do much with 400 hours a year, 1,600 hours in our four years course, but only if we go to work with a certainty that the young students crave knowledge of what we call the humanities, that they read with absolute attention, and that having read, they know. They will welcome the preparation for public speaking, an effort for which everyone must qualify in these days, which the act of narration offers. The alternative is some such concentration scheme as that indicated in Robinson Crusoe, a year's work on soap, its manufacturer, ingredients, the soap trade, soap transport, the uses of soap, how to make out a soap invoice, the sorts of soap, and so on ad infinitum. Each process in the iron, cotton, nail, pin, engine, button, each process in our thousand and one manufacturers will offer its own ingenious concentration scheme. The advocates of utilitarian education will be delighted. The young students will be kept busy and will to some extent use their wits all the time. With what result? Some two centuries ago, when a movement for adolescent education agitated Europe, devastated by the Napoleonic Wars, we English took our part. The current early divided into two streams, the material and the spiritual, the useful and the educative, and England, already great in manufactures, was carried along by the first of these streams, followed by Germany, France, Switzerland, while the Scandinavian group of countries learned at the lips of that father of the people's high schools that spirit is might, 
Spirit reveals itself in spirit. Spirit works only in freedom. We see the apotheosis of utilitarian education in the Munich schools on the one hand and in the morale of the German army on the other. But we are slow to learn because we have set up a little tin god of efficiency in that niche within our private pantheon which should be occupied by personality. We trouble ourselves about the uses of the young person to society. As for his own use, what he should be in and for himself, why, what matter? Because, say we, if we fit him to earn his living, we fit him also to be of service to the world, and what better can we do for him personally? We forget that it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God shall man live, whether it be spoken in the way of some truth of religion, poem, picture, scientific discovery, or literary expression, by these things men live, and in all such is the life of the spirit. The spiritual life requires the food of ideas for its daily bread. We shall find, in the words of a well-known Swedish professor, that just as enrichment of the soil gives the best conditions for the seed sown in it, so a well-grounded humanistic training provides the surest basis for a business capacity, and not the least so in the case of the coming farmer. But we need not go so far afield. We have a prophet of our own, and I will close this part of my subject by quoting certain of Mr. Fisher's words of wisdom. Now let me say something about the content of education, about the things which should be actually taught in the schools, and I am only going to talk in the very broadest possible way. In my afternoon's reading, I came upon another very opposite remark in the letters of John Stuart Mill. Let me read it to you. What the poor as well as the rich require is not to be taught other people's opinions, but to be induced and enabled to think for themselves. It is not physical science that will do this, even if they could learn it much more thoroughly than they are able to do. The young people of this country are not to be regenerated by economic doctrine or economic history or physical science. They can only be elevated by ideas which act upon the imagination and act upon the character and influence the soul, and it is the function of all good teachers to bring those ideas before them. I have sometimes heard it said that you should not teach patriotism in the school. I dissent from that doctrine. I think that patriotism should be taught in schools. I will tell you what I mean by patriotism. By patriotism, I do not mean jingoism, but what I mean by patriotism is an intelligent appreciation of all things noble in the romances, in the literature, and in the history of one's own country. Young people should be taught to admire what is great while they are at school, and remember that for the poor of this country the school is a far more important factor than it is for the rich people of this country. I say that I want patriotism in the larger sense of the term taught in the schools. Of course there is a great deal to criticize in any country, and I should be the last person to suggest that the critical faculty should not be exercised and trained at school. But before we teach children to criticize the institutions of their country, before we teach them to be critical of what is bad, let us teach them to recognize and admire what is good. After all, life is very short. We all of us have only one life to live, and during that life let us get into ourselves as much love, as much admiration, as much elevating pleasure as we can, and if we view education merely as discipline and critical bitterness, then we shall lose all the sweets of life, and we shall make ourselves unnecessarily miserable." There is quite enough sorrow and hardship in this world as it is without introducing it prematurely to young people. N. B. Probably some educational authorities may decide to give one hour or two weekly to physical training and handicrafts, in which case the timetable must allow for so much the less reading. But I should like to urge that with the long evening leisure of which there is promise, Club life will become an important feature in every village and district. Classes will certainly be arranged for military and other drills, gymnastics, dancing, singing, swimming, carpentry, cooking, nursing, dressmaking. 
weaving, pottery, acting, in fact, whatever the quickened intelligence of the community demands. No compulsion would be necessary to enforce attendance at classes, for which the machinery is already in existence in most places, and which, associated with club life, would have certain social attractions in the way of public displays, prize-givings, and so on. The intellectual life of the continuation school should give zest to these evening occupations, as well as to the Saturday field club, which no neighborhood should be without." I have put the case for continuation schools as strongly as may be, but there is a more excellent way. In these days of high wages, it may well happen that parents will be willing to let their children remain at school until the end of their seventeenth year, in which case they will be able to go on with the secondary education which they have begun at the age of six, and we shall see a new thing in the world." Every man and woman will have received a liberal education. Life will no longer discount the ideas and aims of the schoolroom. And if, according to the Platonic saying, knowledge is virtue, knowledge informed by religion, we shall see, even in our own day, how righteousness exalteth a nation. I hope you enjoyed this chapter of Charlotte Mason's Volume 6. And of course, if you need help, there's always the annotated edition, or you can come find us and ask questions. We'd love to help you. You can find us at cmplenary.com or over in our Facebook group. Look forward to chatting with you.